The opinions of J. Michael McCoy and his guests are not necessarily the opinions of KPOG, any particular religious denomination, or any other theological institution. Thanks for listening to Max World Live, living free through forgiveness, live on KPOG and webcastonelive.com. All right, good morning. It is the eighth day of September in the Lord's year 2020. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and we are live here on Facebook on 102 or yeah, 102.9 FM and so many other places. And we're very glad to have you along today. Um, I'm not getting pictures. Um, Gail, are you seeing me? Just give me a thumbs up if you're seeing me. I'm not going to worry about what my uh, instructions say here. Let me know, please. And good morning to you, my friend Gail. If you've never listened to my program before or are uh, fairly new, a couple things to know, and they're all good. One, uh, I'm transparent. Uh, I used to do what I call professional radio. Now I do what I call amateur radio. I know, I know it's supposed to go the other way around. You're supposed to be amateur and then go pro. I was pro for 40-some years, owned radio stations, did big talk shows with political people. and, and Okay, Gail, good. Um, when Jesus mugged me, my life got a little simpler, and then it got even more simple. And so now God uses me and this incredible studio that's been built for me by uh, the church, excuse me, to share stories with you about faith. Um, I no longer try to create controversy on the air by conversation. Um, I just want you to be able to come um, and listen to people's stories and listen to Bible teachings. Um, And so today, um, I'm going to introduce you to a a man by the name of Jack. And uh, Jack and I met in the most peculiar of ways. And I believe that I'm supposed to be in Jack's life and he's supposed to be in mine. How much and how little, we don't know yet. But he has a wonderful story And we're going to begin to tell it today. Um, And I'm simply calling it Prophecy in the Life of Jack. Because it seems to me that uh, Jack has uh, a gift of prophecy. I don't have that gift. Uh, My gift is of faith, and I have the gift of discernment. And I don't know if you call the gift to gab a real gift, but if it is, I have that gift too. That's what my grandmother would say. Uh, He sure has the gift to gab. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about prophecy and the life of Jack. And we're going to start with uh, the last year, right? It's kind of what we thought about. Okay. And then in future programs, we'll back up and we'll learn more about Jack. Um. So, welcome. Thanks for coming to the studios. Yeah, yeah, you're a good guy. All right, so uh, I'm a, I don't know if you know Jesus Calling, but I read that every day. So, here is uh, Jesus Calling, September 8th. And if you don't know uh, the story behind Jesus Calling, Sarah Young, who is the uh, uh, author, was on a mission trip for many years. And every day she would sit down and she would write what she thought Christ was whispering to her or telling her. And he would actually, uh, she would actually write what she felt Christ's message to her was that day. And it's all biblically based. I'll give you at the end of each uh, uh, Jesus calling where it comes from in the Bible. And uh, when I'm reading it, I want you to read it as if Christ is talking to you. Now, don't go there and t- tell somebody, well, Mac thinks he's Jesus. No, I don't. Well, hold on. You're, you're, hold on. I got to get your mic on. All right, go ahead. Yo, 
Mac, I can tell you, uh, my 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 last fiance and my last wife, how how that went down. We uh, built our lives around a devotional that was uh, inspired by God, and she was amazed how every single occurrence on every single day was written about in this book. It was it was like a calendar, you know. But uh, no, so I, I'm very excited about your story here with with your devotional. Yeah, I I'm a I'm a big fan of Jesus Calling. Uh, big fan, have been for ten years maybe. So one of the things you'll hear in my voice when I'm reading it, when I, when Jesus refers to himself, which is usually in the words, me and my, you'll hear me highlight auditorily that word a little bit. And so uh, let me read for you Jesus calling on September 8th. Accept each day exactly as it comes to you. By that I mean, not only the circumstances of your day, but also the condition of your body. Your assignment is to trust me, obviously, resting in my sovereignty and my faithfulness. On some days, your circumstances and your physical condition will feel out of balance. The demands on you seem far greater than your strength. Days like that present a choice between two alternatives, giving up or relying on me. Even if you wrongly choose the first alternative, I will not reject you. You can turn to me at any point, and I will help you crawl out of the mire of discouragement. Push pause. I want to read that line again. This is a line we ought to put on a post-it note and put on our bathroom mirror because this is a, a wonderful encouragement. Days like that when our body and our souls seem to be out of whack, those present a choice between two alternatives, giving up or relying on me. Even if you wrongly choose the alternative, I will not reject you. That's the gospel right there. Push play. I will infuse my strength into you moment by moment, giving you all that you need for this day. Trust me by relying on my empowering presence. From Psalm 42, 2 Corinthians 13, and the guy that I always thought was a bullfrog, Jeremiah 31. All right. Um, so welcome to Tuesday. I hope your Labor Day was good. I don't know about you. Uh, uh, I'm ready for this cooler weather. I know that there are a lot of people that, don't like cooler weather, and I, I love you too. It's okay that you don't like cooler weather, but neener, 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 maybe I get some weather that I'm going to like for a while. I mean, I actually turned the air conditioning off and opened the windows. What a wonderful, wonderful night we are having. But you know the thing about Iowa, if you don't like the weather, stick around, it'll change. All right, so Jack, um, Whatever you want to share about yourself up front, you may. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions. At some point, I will kind of run through the biography or the resume, if you will. Right, right. Oh, by the way, good morning, Robin. Nice to see you. How are you? Love you. Um, just set this up so we can talk about the last year and how God worked through your life um, in... A prophetic way. I mean, am, am I correct in saying that one of your spiritual gifts is prophecy? Um, I mean, God certainly works through you on things it, like that. It depends on what part of the spectrum you're from. I mean, it's a people, big word spectrum. It is a big word because okay. because there's a lot of different types of people in the faith community, and um, there's arguments about where the gift of prophecy um, actually exists, and so. Early on, when I started seeing uh, the Lord, 
make things happen that were absolutely impossible to come together after he had like secretly or quietly told me that things would be that way uh i learned early on that i had to be um vague cryptic um speak those things in some sort of uh pastry some sort of sweet where people didn't realize they were getting news of the future um they were getting a laugh or a joke or some kind of like you know emotional experience instead so that i could point back and be like well right there um but when somebody says the quote unquote gift of prophecy i i wouldn't know that it was exactly that anymore um <coughs> I, I want to talk about 2020, and it's funny because the the way that we got here, the way that I knew that 2020 was going to be the year that everything was going to go absolutely crazy wasn't because of my own gift of prophecy. It was because of the gift of prophecy shared not just with me, but with the entire community of artists, unbeknownst to them. Artists, meaning what oh painters sculptors uh even some musicians okay which is kind of your world yeah you're, I, you're an I'm, artist i'm drawn to the yeah yeah i'm drawn to the art world okay so, yeah all right go ahead so um we we used to have certain things in des moines that everybody passed by and maybe 25 percent of the people recognized were somehow indications of of, of the future in some way and uh, First Assembly of God was one of those places. Yeah. The, the, the signboard out front of that place uh, would week to week would share the common theme of, of what was going to happen in that community, in that area. Uh, but that has And been they were one of the first. Mm, yes, they were. Not just the first church. I mean, businesses didn't have that. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And then they got changed to the Des Moines first. Yeah. Which broke a lot of hearts because that no longer has that prophetic quality yeah so that would be the gift of prophecy in motion if you, as i understand it so as an example so after des moines started tearing down all of those sorts of um i, I don't know i i kind of call them uh prophetic indicators for lack of a better word uh th th thermometers almost like our, our spiritual health was dictated by these sorts of things or or predicated i guess by these sorts of when, when des moines tore all of those down uh, the artists, whether or not they were even saved, were somehow beginning to paint paintings um, that would foretell the future of Des Moines. And, and one of the most in-your-face examples of these uh, exists as a mural down north of Capitol Square, just a half a block on the north side of Walnut. There's a mural on the wall there. I know. Hold on. Capitol Square, so the big white building that the register is in. Yeah, well, where the where the where the, where the umbrella is, the big yeah. green umbrella, right? Yeah. And go north. Yeah, if you're standing uh, right by the white building, okay, Capitol Square, and uh, you've got the umbrella on your right, facing north, you'll you'll be able to see it from from right there. It's on the it's on just a half a block north. It, it it it's on the if I recall it's on the wall that is just east of the Savory Hotel. Mm -hmm. There's a parking lot, but, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Used to be Story Kenworthy. I don't know if it still is, but yeah. I think that's the business that used to be in that building. Yeah. Well, the spl the splash is still down there and underneath, it, but I don't think the splash will ever go away. Everyone loves that place. Um. Anyway, you look at that. You look at that, and you can see this year. You can see the highlights of Des Moines this year. You can see the intimidation of uh, angry mobs uh, addressing um, white suburban America. It's right there in the... But what's really freaked out is, is for the conspiracy theorists in the world, there's even an Illuminati eye that's somehow creating all the terror. This has been on our wall for I don't know how long. Yeah, I, when was that painted? No idea, and well, I don't know even know who to talk to because the, there's there's been no response to the business owner or the building owner. I get you know I start asking about this kind of stuff, and everybody starts to kind of cl close up, and like I just want to know who the artist was for that. Well, and how long has it been there? Just has it been there a year? Has it been there five years? I know I know that it's been there since before BLM showed up, which is okay. which is all that I need to know. 
but I can't put a year on it because that that particular mural did not stand out. It looked like a bunch of random pieces got thrown together and didn't make any sense right. at all. And then suddenly it did to a bunch of people uh, in late June. All right. So, again, for those of you, and I, I can see the mural in my head, uh, this would be um, between 4th and 5th, right? Mm-hmm. It would be north of um, the Capitol Square, Mm -hmm. Um, but it would be on the other side than the umbrella, because the umbrella is on fourth. Is that is that that, that's Locust there? I think yes, it's it's Locust. North side of Locust, right there. Walnut runs to the south. Yeah, it's on the north side of Locust. Yep, and uh, uh, yeah, it is the parking lot that is between the Savory. And the building, um, yeah, yeah, whatever that building is. Yeah. I just know it as a Story Kenworthy building. So, so that's the first mural uh, that I'm willing to be like able, or w- willing to point to and say, yes, you can definitely see there's some sort of prophetic gift taking place here. It's it's the most empirical um, because of the general local knowledge of what's taken place in Des Moines here in the the year 2020. Um, however, prior to that. Uh, the most impactful uh, prophetic indicators that uh, manifested through our artists um, were often housed in the coffee houses, uh, the center points of, of our community. Uh, kind of one of the gears where we all got to know each other and sniff each other out. It didn't Java Joe's... I'm not a coffee person, mm-hmm. but didn't that have some artwork in there yeah java joe's was probably the origin of the mystique behind it uh there were maybe seven pieces in total between the years 1995 six and 2005 or six so about 10 years yeah so only about seven or eight pieces out of that entire time that had that like dramatic whoa, this piece has been here all along, and this just took place. Like, the whole thing, yes. But Mars Cafe, um, when it was in its high time, uh, every single month, every single artist uh, would change, and not just one picture, but the entire uh, room. And Mars Cafe is in the Drake area? Is in the Drake area. Is it still open? Yes, it's still open. Okay. I apologize. I don't know that. I'm not embarrassed at it. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, So different artists can take their work in there, and it's displayed. And here's what got me so interested. When when it started happening regularly at Mars Cafe, the the question arises, okay, these artists painted or drew or photographed these things up to three and four years or more before they were ever actually on the wall for that month in that particular time. And the people who selected the art as to who would have what time slot, they would choose those up to six months before they were ever on the wall. Mm. So so the orchestration of this- They, I, they would choose the pieces or the artist? The artist, okay. the artist. Yeah, and then the artist would throw up their But uh, of course, you know, they, they would do the samples and like, this is what I wanna put here. So. So I guess maybe both, because when you pick the artist, you kind of see what they're going to put up. Um, but, there, but there was no way that anybody involved could have made the situations occur of their own will. They couldn't have forced any month or any show, any prophetic moment um, out of their own power. It all happened organically, and it all happened to this time structure of even three years before. So that's what got me like really, really paying attention to things. Now, do you think, do you think, um, how do I put this? Do you know other people that saw what you saw? Each month would have a specific family or a specific uh, person even that they were being forewarned. Um, One, the last one right before COVID started closing everything down. Uh, and this is probably the simplest one for anybody to, to understand. 
um, there were maybe 75 pictures put up. And 74 of them were things that we find in pop and, and pop culture. <coughs> pardon me, pop culture um, and kind of like the the funk commercial world for children. Um, like it was like Nickelodeon and, and the rest of the world, like MTV and, and just uh, people. And then there was one coronavirus and they had never had a virus on the wall at Mars Cafe. Wait, wait, hold on, back up. There was a painting? There was a, uh, actually I think it was a stencil or a pencil about a uh, virus it was a virus with the same sort of shape that the corona's family has like it was a coronavirus it wasn't necessarily covid-19 um and the specifically the uh talking about that circle with all the little spikes yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so the, so the the prophetic quality about that and i photographed this and it's already on my facebook so it's been dated a little bit and like i can show like i photographed a lot of these uh over the years cuz people like you would be interested one day the, the the spikes the spikes were elongated, uh, so you had the normal coronavirus yeah. shape, but every spike was elongated, and and even that quality of the art was a prophetic symbolism of how this would be taken too far. Yeah, the 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 ones I've seen look like they have bolts, the end of bolts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you screw into a, a wall or something. Yep. And you're saying these had more of a pointed? Well, they were just, yeah, instead of just being little nodules that they walk, yeah. they, they were exposed and pulled out and stretched out so that they were almost as long as the virus was wide itself. Did they have any identification as to what certain spikes meant? No, nope, no, nope. it was just, it was just, so that was in, that was the February, that was the February showing. And so did you, were you able to talk to the artist about where this vision came from? I tried so many times and I had probably about a 10% success rate month to month. You know, okay. I did not get to meet the guy that did this one in particular. Um, it's I don't right. know anything. I've never been to the Mars Cafe, but I would think they would have contact information for each of the artists. Right. And then that's the problem with Des Moines. You start talking about the kind of stuff that we're talking about today, and everybody gets this fear, and they stop talking. Um, so, Because, look, because now in hindsight, we had one picture out of, like, I'm, I'm estimating 75, one picture, and the rest was all just a bunch of common people's likes and just everybody in the room, and one virus. There was no dictation that this was prophecy anywhere inside of the cafe. People come and people go and they never see any of this. It's just right next to them and they, you know, whatever. Um, now, in hindsight, that person, if they were informed that they inadvertently, incidentally prophesied the next seven months. Seven years. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, what is that going to do to their to their psyche? What is that going to do to their ego? Because I've 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 made mistakes in the past about approaching people like this, and I have ultimately ultimately learned not to tinker with it. Like there's a respect here that I'm supposed to have. Like there's something holy underneath all of this that isn't to be toyed with or messed with or yeah. you know. And I've learned that the hard way. Um, Tell me what that means. What, mm. what, what is learning the hard way for Jack? Learning the hard way for Jack. Uh, so there's scripture about teachers who uh, abuse the word, basically. Uh, that they, they're, they're in danger of a greater judgment. Okay. Um, is that you? Well, that's anybody with, with, with knowledge with, with, with the, of the truth. Okay. If we ever use the truth to, to one-up on somebody by like withholding it or distorting it, like it comes back on us. I don't think I. Do. I, I don't. Yeah, I hope I don't do that. that well, you'll know it because it's a catechism. It's it's a, it's a, it's a it's a catastrophe when 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 that kind of. Um, so, so being poor a lot in my life, um, the last time I ever resorted to stealing, for instance, uh, was was eleven years ago. And I tricked myself. I was like, everybody knows I'm poor. I'm going to buy one and just grab the other. I'm at least buying one. You know, like I fell right into that pit. Uh, I was arrested on false charges within 48 hours and held for a month. Now, hold on. You said, wait a minute. 
how can they be false charges if you really stole something? The charges had nothing to do with it. Charges had nothing to do with it. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's, the, that's the other thing. So there's two voices, right? If there's a voice of prophecy in the world, I just want to say that the voice of propaganda is at mortal war with it. Sure, I agree with that. This presidential election is proof of that. Right, right. So I can finally say something like that this year. But on the more local level, where it's not exactly propaganda, there are still voices at war with prophecy and those who carry it. So the moment one of us like slip up really bad, where we break a, com- where we break a commandment, like I said, it's been 12 years, um, we're stepping into a danger zone where the enemy can take pop shots at us. And the voice that comes out to, to, to take those pop shots, nothing in it is true. But everybody listens to it because it is now louder than the voice of prophecy. Sure. Now, by the way, for those of you that are just tuning in, uh, this is a new friend of mine by the name of Jack. I don't even know your last name. You don't, I don't want you to say it. Right. Um, uh, and um, he, has an, uh, he has an interesting gift. And I don't know what it's called, um, but he sees things. First of all, you do see things through a biblical eye. Yes, sir. And 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 the same biblical eye that I see things through. In other words, it's a it's a genuine biblical eye. You're not a uh, at least as far as I can tell, you're not some religious freak out there. You're not going to show up at the airport tomorrow and play a tambourine <laughs> type of thing. Right. Um, I did invite Jack to two church services with me this weekend, and uh, you found it all just normal, right? Yeah. Just good stuff. Uh, normal, yeah, um, is an interesting word. I, I tried to tell you about my years at the uh, Cornerstone Music Festival Yeah. Um, and how the entire spectrum of, of belief is there. So I trained myself to be able to approach each individual section of that gathering as a brother and as a friend now there are some pretty abnormal sorts there um but i have come to understand that people like yourself and churches like this especially uh ones that are willing to hold on to a truth that nobody else is willing to hold on to yeah and we are right um those are more anointed. And so I would call the anointing normal. Okay. I don't know I would call any of you guys normal because that, that standard is not exactly the right. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> we're, we're all you peculiar. used the word abnormal before, and I, 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 I resemble that remark. <laughs> right. <laughs> we you all know? do. We're peculiar people. We yeah, peculiar I mean, I people. have found that the more, and I can only speak for myself, the more my identity is in Christ rather than in where I live and what I drive and what I wear and what I do and mm-hmm. what I own. And, um, you know, when Jesus first mugged me, I was one self-righteous son of a gun. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden I had the truth and I was going to tell everybody that I had the truth. And Oh, by the way, you didn't. I made the same mistake. All right. Well, and, and this is in my book, but it was an amazing moment. Um, I, I was telling a story. I was fabricating a story on the air. And if you looked behind the scenes of it, which was pretty obvious, mm-hmm. I was taking a stab at a group of people, a, pr- a group of people that um, uh, I now realize Jesus would embrace, would not condemn. And I was condemning. And uh, a person who was a part of that group called me after my show that day, and they were in tears genuine tears a woman and said i just can't believe the guy that i tell people is such a neat guy would say something like that Mm. and so i i i was disturbed by that because i have a lot of respect for this person now we're talking nine years ago eight years right right after i first got mugged yeah when you're a baby yeah yeah when i was a baby that's right still drinking milk Mm -hmm. and i sent an email uh, to my one of my pastors, and my question was this: Is it my job to preach the gospel, or is it my job to defend the gospel, or simply to preach it? And that was a very important question for me. Right. 
He came back. I wish I would have saved the email, but I'll never forget. He came back and said this. God's a big dude. He can defend himself. Mm. And Jack, literally, I felt the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit at the time. Right. I felt the Holy Spirit move in me, and I, I've, since then, I don't have a pharisaical bone in my body. My job is simply to preach the gospel. It is not my job to look at you or anybody and say, well, you know, you're breaking this commandment. Mm. Or if you were a better Christian, you'd do this. It's not within me. Which if you had known the old Mac, mm -hmm. that dude lived strong in me. I mean, I'm, I'm a talk show host. I was a <laughs> political talk show host. It was my job to tell people what a goofball this guy was and this guy wasn't. And yeah. what an incredible journey Jesus has me on because I, I just don't, I don't judge people. I, in fact, I embrace those that are judged by others. He, he shook me down. Uh on the Cottage Grove Bridge, Cottage Grove Bridge there, um, by MLK. Yeah. I was coming across, uh, just getting to the bridge, and I saw somebody on the far side. I could barely make out their head. It was the size of an ant. And by the time I saw their shoulders, I had already judged them and decided that I didn't want to talk to them. It took a split second. 100 yards off almost. I've already figured out that this person's below me. And the Lord just jumped me right there yeah. and said, what are you doing? Yeah. Thou shalt not judge. And, 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 and started to... And that's a cultural thing in Des Moines, Mac. That's what I want to tell you here. It's not something that you should feel so bad necessarily personally and shame for, for, for your own actions. But, but we as Des Moinesites, or whatever you want to call us, we all are like that. And so we all have to go through a personal journey and, and and break that that cycle of insta judgment and being better than ever and, and then, then he just comes. Well, and I so you've never met Frank. Frank used to be my on air partner here on this radio station. And prior to us starting here, we worked together. Uh, he was part of my team for ten years. Started as a caller. That's how I, I, I met Frank. It is absolute clear to me that Frank has the opposite calling that I do, and yet we're doing it for the same king. Mm. He feels, and he would tell you, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I, I, I'm mm -hmm. comfortable saying this, that people are not going to recognize their sin. They're straying away from God and doing the devil's will unless somebody points it out to him. And he feels that's his calling. And he, he, I know, but he does it well. Mm. And quite frankly, I get a goosebump when I say this. I'm glad it's his calling and not mine. Well, so the sliver in the log or the sliver in the beam or the, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody knows that story. And in my particular walk, I've had to call out some sin too. I've been told to. I've been commanded to. I've been... If I do or don't, it's, it's going to be bad. So I better do. And I've learned that if you have to absolutely point out the sin, you just touch it with the tip of your pinky, metaphorically. You don't say anything about it. You don't even talk about the sin. You just touch it, just, just trigger it, and let them see it for themselves. Yeah, oh, that's always, I mean, that's best for me. Much easier for me to see it than you to come tell me. Because if you come tell me, my, my flesh will strike out. That's right. And that's dangerous for and people that's like Satan. me. Yeah, that is. Yeah. That is. So, um, anyway, that, Sorry. we got off the point. It's all right. But it, it, is, it, it is the best. I mean, I want to cry right now. It is the best part of my relationship with Jesus that I no longer was called to point out um, things that I saw. Because I have the gift of discernment. That's not, nobody argues that. But I used to use that gift in the absolute wrong way. So 
to me, discernment means I find out your positives and your negatives, what motivates you and what doesn't motivate you. The things to say that would hurt you and the things to say that would lift you up and motivate you. Well, before Jesus mugged me, and I'm not proud of this at all, but before Jesus mugged me, I'd find out what motivates you. And I'd do the opposite. Mm. Well, you know, that gets a lot of, uh, what they call them likes now. You would call them subscribers or viewers or listeners before, right? That, yeah. that gets you a lot of likes. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the world. Yeah, it was. And uh, um, on the other hand, uh, I would ask people who came to work for me, I'd say, I, I'm picking up my phone for those of you that aren't watching. I pick up my phone and say, this is my jack remote control. Right. And this button up here, if I push this, I motivate you. Mm. Give you whatever you want. Wow. Just change your life in a good way. Mm. If I push this button down here, that's your Achilles heel. You're not going to like me. I need to know what both of those are because if I know what the bottom is, how to hurt you, to make you mad, to crank you off, whatever. Um, if I don't do that, we avoid our first fight as a staff. And if I, on the other hand, do the top a lot, then you're probably going to enjoy working with me less than you don't. And the truth of the matter is, and mostly it was because of the team I had around me. I, 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 I don't know if I was a leader or not. I know I was a facilitator of businesses. I created conversation, and that's how I ran my businesses. But I know that I watched people pass through my companies and go on to greatness. And I want to take just a teeny little bit of credit for pushing that top button and doing my best to never push the bottom button. Right. Now I don't ever push the bottom button. Right. It, it, it's all taped over and can't push it. But like you said, I like the way you put that. Sometimes you just take the tip of your little finger and you touch it. And I've never thought about this before, but in a way, it's a prayer. God, I see this, but I don't know how to handle it. So I, if there's whatever you want me to do to help Jack or help Frank or help Sally, I'm, I'm giving myself to you. I'm, I'm volunteering to you use me to help that person realize how they should grow closer to you. And that, and that edges into the reality that your life itself should be a prayer which is the toughest thing for a lot of the young ones in the lord to actually wrap their heads around They're, they go oh my gosh the bible says to pray without ceasing that sounds so absolutely difficult but when you're in love with someone like you're constantly communicating with them you know and as as you learn uh, just how absolutely beautiful everything really is, it's really easy to fall in love uh, with the one that created all of that. So, so the life is a prayer, and, you know, we can't do anything in our own power. We're not here to, to stop people from, from whatever their sin is. That's not our job. But a lot of times people don't realize uh, how much control even those little sins have over us. Uh, Mac, I'm impressed that you caught the fact that that if somebody were to touch a sliver in my eye, I would, I, I would lash out. You know, a lot of people don't realize that's why that Bible verse is there. If you start mm -hmm. talking about the little things in everyone else's eyes, it's not even necessarily about the beam in your own. Uh, but it is also about them getting so angry and creating division, and you're breaking people's lives up. Like yeah. you, you know, it, it destroys community. Uh, that's one or the other. I have, um, and I don't, I think this is right, Jack, but God laid on my heart several years ago that for me, just for me, the definition of speaking truth in love, you know, we're always told, well, just tr spook, sp uh, blah, 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 speak truth in love. I don't know what that means. And then he shared with me, and this is how I practice. So if I want to share the truth with you, which you can redefine those words into grabbing your sliver while I, my plank hangs out high. <laughs> I, I, however you want it. Right. Right. 
I would ask you this. Jack, can I tell you something you don't want to hear? Do I have your permission? And it is, it is truly your permission I seek to share with you something that I've observed. I don't give people that BS, pardon my language, that mm-hmm. BS line is, God laid something on my heart to share with you. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> if God's going to lay it on my heart, why did he lay it on your heart too? Mm-hmm. So, if I say, Jack, can I tell you something you don't want to hear? If your answer is no, I highly respect that. I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to tell you anyway. Because that's the devil right there. Right, right. By you saying yes, I'm hoping that you realize that I'm going to do something as kindly as I possibly can and that I am not your enemy. In fact, I'm your friend. I'm your brother. And I have found when telling people things with that phrase first that it, it, it creates a brotherhood and a sisterhood, whatever it is. Because that person real I hope that person realizes that it's a gift I'm trying to give them, not criticism, not pharisaical review of the plank in their eye compared mm-hmm, to mine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the only time it's ever really necessary to do that, in my opinion, um, is when whatever action or behavior <laughs> you're concerned with is actually causing damage to other people or is terminally damaging themselves. There's not really often a time, and that's something... That, that's good. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we're just being meddlers. And there's, and there's scripture about being... Oh. Yeah, don't be a meddler. Right. No. We are not, you know... G- <laughs> it's a good conversation. I figured out, or Jesus laid on my heart, or whatever it is, because for years and years and years, I would pray to God. Not Jesus, because I had no use for Jesus. Right. I would pray to God, God, what's your will for my life? And oh, by the way, here's two quarters. I'm going to put, put them in the Coke machine, and here's what I want the answer to be. Oh, when people ask me questions, you, you even you even kind of triggered it right at the start when you said gift of prophecy. Because like, like, that's people putting two quarters in. Yeah. So... um. I believe, I'm going to use that word believe, and you, physically you just saw my, my, my body change. Yep, light up. I believe that God's will for you, me, and everyone, there's no one that's not included in this, is Matthew 28. Go out into the world, make disciples of all men and women, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what does he tell, what does he tell Peter, right? I think it was Peter. Be fishers of men? Yeah. Now, I will add to that, now that I know what his will is for me, would you like, I'm talking to Jesus now, would you like me to create a ministry around that and how? In other words, it's got to be tied to creating disciples among all men and women. Mine is through forgiveness. Those who have been forgiven much love much. Mine is I'm here and my audience, God bless every one of them, knows that if they ever hit that wall or they know somebody that hits that wall, that they can't move on because they can't forgive. They can't forgive their spouse who divorced them. They can't forgive their grandfather for abusing them. They can't forgive their pastor for what he's done, church hurt? Sometimes it's harder than others. Um, and I always try to work in the parable about the man who was forgiven of you know the millions of dollars that he owed the king. Mm-hmm. And straight away the guy goes out after he yes. was forgiven and picks up the guy, his servant, by the throat yep. for two bucks. Give me your two dollars you, you, you owe me. He probably doesn't even owe him the two dollars, to be honest, right? This is, you know, yeah. right? Um, but the guy gets taken back in and he's not just put into prison. And this is, this is, this is so important that, that people who believe uh, the name of Christ and want to live uh, a godly life, they, they need to grab a hold of this. 
the person was not just delivered to jail. He was delivered to the tormentors until he would pay back every cent that he owed the king. Well, how do you pay back anything when you're in chains being tormented? So the lesson was actually, if you have been forgiven of everything by the king, but you cannot forgive everyone of every little thing, Mm. then don't expect your mm. forgiveness to bring you the reward that you think. It's actually the other. And that's hard for people to hear. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, so I, just you little background on me. So I had been mugged, I was my, mugged by Jesus on the 20th of July in 2010. I thought in my self-righteous way that his will for me my ministry would be to be on the radio and preach the gospel and become the great j michael mccoy preacher i mean i even went to seminary and come to find out nope that wasn't it and uh in the summer of 16 i was given the opportunity to prepare for a trip to the holy land over christmas Mm. To broadcast live from Bethlehem every day. Whoa. Yeah, now, you, you, you get the goose pumples, too. Mm. I mean, it's just that whole trip was incredible. But I started to pray to God, now, I'm going to go there. And however you need to prepare me, however you need to mold me, chisel off character defects, I'm asking you to please, when I'm there, would you please tell me what your, your mission is for me, my ministry? Because finding out it wasn't radio wasn't devastating. It just left a hole. Okay, what is it then? I, I don't care if it's radio or not. I want to do it. And I was going through a very difficult time in my life, and my forgiver had never worked. My making a list, literally a f- physical list, I'll call it my feces list, and you know what I mean. I really had one. <laughs> right. I really had one. And so the idea of forgiveness was just silly. But what I would later learn is you can't give something away unless you have it. And standing at the Wailing Wall, Christmas Eve, dark out, praying to God, he said one thing to me in answer to my question, what is your ministry for me? He said, forgive. Not forgiveness, not just one word, forgive. And then it was confirmed later through another source. Um, A man I really thought was probably an angel or Jesus, you know. So I began to do everything I could to understand forgiveness. And the good news is, in five years, I've learned it myself. And I've been brought along some beside people who God brought me along some side people, beside some people. And I've heard from a couple of wives. I mainly work with men. I've heard from a couple of wives. I've, I've heard from a couple of mothers. And just my guys in my Bible studies have learned how to forgive some things that they could never forgive before. So... So the soil of unforgiveness is the only place in the human heart that bitterness can grow. That bitterness can what? Can grow, can take root. Absolutely. The soil of unforgiveness is the only place in the human heart that bitterness can take root. And I, I learned this perhaps one of the hardest ways. Um, my, my biological mother, this is going to set off a flag, my biological mother uh, was the third most notorious black magic practicing witch in the Midwest here in New Orleans. Um, If there's any young listeners, you're going to want to put some cotton in their ears real quick. She had the the pentagram painted in blood in the basement. Uh, She had animal sacrifices and the kind of things that you would read about in, you know, any occult book for, for that kind of... She was found in seven pieces in Las Vegas in 2001. Seven pieces? Seven like, pieces. Just, in a just cardboard box. Yeah, she um, she was an exotic dancer. 
and uh, she liked the heroin. Mm. Um, and that draw pulled her all the way out there. Uh, so early on, the Lord showed me the, the penalty for, for sin and the reward for certain things. Like she did that to all these things and it happened to her. Um, 15, 16 years later, you know, like nobody would have faulted me if I didn't forgive the man who had done that to her. I never met the guy, you know, and after all that amount of time, I, I never even had a, a thought about him. Like he wasn't anywhere in my heart. I didn't think about it. At least I thought it was that way. But I started having these explosions of anger and outrage and, and, and I, would, I would scream at somebody in particular and just, just let them have it over the smallest. Mm. And I'm praying to God about it one day. And I'm like, Lord, why am I just suddenly so uncontrollably full of rage? And I was reminded of the same, of the same uh, parable that I, I like to put in people's faces. You know, I was touching the sliver in their eyes, but here's the bean in my own. And I had to forgive that guy right there. He says, do you want to be free of this bitterness? Forgive the man who did this to your mother. Do you, I don't want you to say it. Do you know his name? No, I never did find out. Okay, so you're, you're, for, you're not forgiving a human. You're forgiving the action that that human took. Right. Good. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, well, because this is a, this is a mess inside of my heart. Yeah. And you know, I didn't realize that this amount of unforgiveness, even though it was forgotten, was still the soil of unforgiveness and the but root it's of not bitterness. Forgotten. The bitterness had grown. It had grown so much in over fifteen years of time. That bitterness, although, although I was not often, I was never often related to the kinds of thoughts that would that would spring it out. By the time it had fully grown, any thought would bring it out the bitterness and the rage. And so once I was able to forgive him of that, I was actually setting myself free. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. You, you see, you just said the cornerstone of my ministry. Forgiving someone is the most selfish thing you'll ever do because you're doing it for you. Yeah. You're not doing it for them. Why let them have that much control over your destiny? Well, it's interesting we should talk about yeah, we're getting out of there. So my youngest daughter and I uh, have had a wonderful relationship all of our lives. Now, we've had a few spots because dad's made some stupid mistakes. My youngest daughter's faith is different than mine, um, more so through my eyes than hers. And we were sitting yesterday. Uh, we always go out. At we try to go out every weekend with my grandson, who just turned two and just spend some time together. And she told, she used some references, something I did for somebody and said, see, that's why you're gonna be in heaven, dad. It isn't your faith. It's you're a good person. And this is not a conversation we get, we have. Mm. We just don't, we don't have them. Right. They're not good. They're dangerous. They don't help us. But I did take a chance and it worked okay by I didn't give her the gospel. She knows the gospel. She was raised with the gospel. Mm -hmm. I said to her, honey, I had to learn to forgive because God challenged me. When the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? That Lord's prayer is just filled with lay down and take it easy and I'll be there with you. Da 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 da, except for one line. Forgive your trespassers as I will forgive you. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the, I don't know what you want to call it. I've used the word cornerstone already, but I learned to forgive the way I have learned to forgive because I want to be forgiven that same way. I cannot stand before, I cannot stand before God in judgment and say, well, but I never gave you that bad of stuff you had to forgive me for, Lord, but this person over here, that's completely different and there's no way. I can't do that. 
Yeah, and Jack is laughing at me right now. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at myself, honestly, because it's it's. I've had moments like that. Yeah, I only can find. I can only find that level of forgiveness in Jesus on the cross. I can't find it anywhere else. And if we're ambassadors, then we need to behave like what we are ambassadoring. Sure. Right. So if 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 that's that forgiveness is us, and that's what we are demonstrating. That's that's how the ambassadorship works in that regard. Well, and 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 that became the whole reconstruction of my life story. The book that I wrote started out being called "The Legitimate Bastard," because I was an, uh, an unwanted pregnancy. Uh, I was an orphan. I was put in an orphanage. I finally got adopted, and even though I love those people incredibly wasn't the family I would have chosen um but when I wrote my book it was kind of a well I'm gonna I'm gonna name some names I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, right. I'm gonna let people know who hurt me Uh oh. and Jesus came in and rewrote that book and it's now called living free through forgiveness and it's really the stories of how yes people wronged me but that wasn't the greatest thing. The greatest thing was through Christ, I was able to lose that burden, that resentment, and give them genuine forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. And genuine forgiveness, uh, and I've had pastors argue with me on this, I believe genuine forgiveness comes with genuine forgetting. Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-two says, they will be my people, and I will be their God. And I will make a new covenant with them. And I will never remember their sins. Now, if God can say, I'm not going to remember your sins, I believe that being made in his own image, I need to strive for that too. So I really work on the two parts of forgiveness the part for me and the part for God which says I'm not going to remember it. I'm not going to bring it up sometime I'm not going to say well hell I guess I wasted my time forgiving you because now you're coming after me again I, I'm, I don't do that goldfish goldfish is where I learned now you got to tell me what that means so the scientific narrative of goldfish um, is that they have a memory of 15 seconds <laughs> So as, uh, as one of my early uh, taboo artists had, had once said, uh, the, the plastic castle is a surprise every time. That's how I try to live life. Yeah. Well, our time is up. I appreciate you coming on here. I think uh, you'll be back. I hope you will. Um, anybody have questions or anything for Jack, uh, send them to me and I'll forward them on at and when he's, when he's comfortable with uh, giving you contact information for him, Facebook information or whatever, then we'll give it to you. But for now, if you'll just trust me, as I ask you sometimes with my guests, the story is the guest that I want, uh, not, 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 not the rap sheet, not the details, not the resume. And so I think you can see why. Uh, after the show today, I asked Jack to come on, and there's much more conversation to have. So thank you, brother. I hope you all have a great and wonderful week, and bless you all. Yeah. Let's love this weather. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, I, I always thank you at this point for listening. And I say something that is the most honest thing I think I say every day other than I love you, Jesus, please forgive me. I say that I love my job. And I couldn't do it without you. Because if you're not giving me feedback, if you're not telling me what you don't like, as often as you tell me what you do like, this show will get stagnant in my mind. And my mind's not a great place to hang around in all the time. So I'm always interested in your input. I'm always interested in your heart, your thoughts. Remember, I give you permission to tell me something I don't want to know. And with that in mind, I will bid you adieu. 
Thanks for listening. Love this job. Couldn't do it without you. Right here at KPOG and webcast1live.com. I love you.